In this episode of Compliance into the Weeds, Tom Fox and Matt Kelly take a deep dive into the recent SEC enforcement action involving McDonald's board's action around disclosures of information in the firing of former CEO Steve Easterbrook. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, for another episode of the award-winning Compliance into the Weeds. Matt, today we have a delicious uh, corporate scandal that's played out in uh, some interesting ways uh, that have become uh, significant here in early 2023. So you want to tell our audience or remind them, I should say, uh, the saga of Steve Easterbrook. Sure. So this was an enforcement action from the Securities and Exchange Commission that came down last week. Uh, It involves Steve Easterbrook, the former CEO of McDonald's. He was the CEO there in the mid and late 2010s. Uh, He was fired in 2019 for having a improper affair uh, with a subordinate at McDonald's. That was a clear violation of McDonald's code of conduct. So they decided that they would part ways with Mr. Easterbrook. Although as part of that separation agreement, McDonald's gave Easterbrook a severance package of equity awards, mostly, I think, that was worth about $40 million. Uh, Then, that all happened in 2019, then came news in 2020 that actually Steve Easterbrook did not have an affair with a subordinate at McDonald's. He had multiple affairs with multiple subordinates at McDonald's, and he lied about that to McDonald's during the first investigation of uh, his misconduct the previous year, in 2019. So McDonald's hits the roof. They haul him into court. And uh, in 2021, Easterbrook and McDonald's finally settled out of court where Easterbrook refunded McDonald's $105 million uh, in an executive compensation clawback. Now, that was then. Why is this news now? Because now, last week, the SEC took actually two enforcement actions. First, they uh, slapped Easterbrook. Uh, for his behavior, and he did not plead, uh, he did not admit nor deny any guilt in the charges, but he was charged, and then he agreed to pay $400,000 in compensation, uh, or as a penalty to settle the case. But Tom, what really caught my eye was that the SEC also sanctioned McDonald's. Now, they did not actually impose a penalty on McDonald's, but they did fault McDonald's for not disclosing to investors in 2019 that McDonald's board, I presume the board, it's the CEO being fired, it must be the board who said decided this, but the board had decided to use judgment or they had exercised um, discretion in giving Easterbrook that first pay package, that severance award back in 2019. But they had not disclosed to investors that they had exercised uh, discretion in deciding what to give Easterbrook. And the SEC took issue with that. So they sanctioned McDonald's. Um, McDonald's agreed to a cease and desist order. That was the whole of it. There was no financial penalties involved. Uh, But this is the first time we've seen the SEC take an enforcement action like that against the company. Uh, And the Republican commissioners on the commission were not thrilled with this. They did not support the idea. Uh, But it raises some interesting questions about the board's duty to be telling investors what it is or isn't doing and why these announcements about discretion, I think, are telling. And given all the attention we've paid to executive comp, um, frankly, because exec comp is always sexy, it's always great to talk about a CEO who misbehaves on the job and gets fired. Got to love that. Um, But we talk an awful lot these days about executive comp clawback clauses. The Justice Department is talking about it. The SEC is talking about it. And now we have this case where that is really the heart of the matter. So it's a very telling case, I think, about what the SEC is thinking these days. So is this this, uh, an enforcement action against uh, McDonald's, even though there was no penalty for making it the board making a decision? Uh, It was a cease and desist order and McDonald's board said it would cease and desist. So I guess that counts as enforcement. They were told not to do it again and they said that they won't. Uh, There was no slap of any of these or anything. But uh, as I said, it's, um, you know, it it is a controversial decision. Not all the commissioners were thrilled with this. Uh, Raises some interesting questions about what you are or 
aren't supposed to disclose in maybe the proxy statement or in other disclosures that you might make to the SEC. Uh, but really, it's kind of pushes the bounds of what is a board's duty to inform shareholders about its thinkings and about its decisions. And I think that that's something that compliance officers and corporate governance enthusiasts might want to sit down and give some thought to. So as I recall, the original decision to uh, separate Easterbrook from the company, as you correctly noted, uh, included a compensation package because it was determined to be without cause. Uh, later, um, the board in a subsequent investigation turned up these prior affairs. And as I recall, Easterbrook was uh, chastised in the second set of uh, or the second investigation for number one, not disclosing his prior affairs. But it turns out in those affairs, his conduct was much worse in terms of conflicts of interest and promoting um, some of the women he had affairs with yep. up the chain um, for no apparent reason other than they'd had an affair with him. So how or, or why should McDonald's be chastised for making a decision and using its discretion in the first instance, if it didn't have information around the uh, facts that led to the clawback in the second decision? Well, I think the key issue here is that the board decided to terminate Mr. Brook in 2019 without cause. They decided that. They had the option to terminate him with cause because he was not supposed to have an affairs with subordinates, period. That's it. Doesn't matter if you promoted them or not or how you treated them or anything like that. Said in the code of conduct, you should not have any affairs with your subordinates, which he did. Uh, and he had agreed that if he violated the code of conduct, that would be grounds to be fired. And then they decided to give him the severance package anyways and treat it as fired without cause. Um, my whole point, and I think the SEC's enforcement division as well, is that the board decided to do this. They didn't have to. They could have been sticklers and said, dude, you violated the code and that was termination for cause. That was enough. He did it. Like, there's no two ways about it. Uh, and they could have been meanies. And I think, you know, perhaps they should have been. Um, but they decided they were not going to be meanies and they would let him keep his severance package. And the enforcement division's point is that the board decided that, and they should have disclosed to investors, we used our discretion. That is the praise in the enforcement order, is that the board disclosed that it used its discretion. And I would argue, and this is where it relates back maybe more to directly to corporate ethics, is that when we talk about using discretion, what we really mean is that we are using judgment. That is what using discretion means. You are making a judgment. You have two choices. You could do either this or that, but I am using my discretion to do this, but not that. That's it. And when you're exercising judgment, that is a window into the values and priorities that you have. Now, look, people, McDonald's could have exercised his judgment to say, no, Easterbrook, you violate the code. One instance is all we need to say that you violated the code and we're not going to give you a dime. There's the door. They could have done that. And that would have given us a window into a certain line of thinking about the board and their values and their priorities. Um, instead, they said, look, we could fire you for cause, but that's going to be a big mess. You're might, maybe you're going to sue us. It's going to look bad. So we'll just give you the severance and there's the door and go quietly. That's a very different set of judgments and priorities and I think that the SEC's point here is that investors have a right to know that. They have a right to see into that window and then make decisions about it. You know, if they have a better sense of what the board's values and priorities are, then they can decide, do I want to invest in this company or not? The board or they are the shareholders' representatives. Shareholders have a right to know, do I trust this board or not? You can only do that when you have transparency into their thinking. And that seems to be the the big issue here that the SEC Enforcement Division was trying to get at. Matt, let's celebrate uh, the name of our podcast, Into the Weeds, by going into the weeds. Sure. Around the SEC rule that was invoked here. And you cite it in your blog post, uh, which we're going to link to in the show notes, is 14A3, item 402J, which says in part, uh, 
requires disclosure of, quote, material factors regarding agreements that provide for payment to a named executive in connection with his or her termination, end quote. And I think you go on to, to say in your blog post that you find the enforcement action sits precisely within the rule, uh, yet the Republican commissioners don't believe that. Um, what are your thoughts on the weeds of the rule? Well, this was interesting because, yes, the two Republican commissioners, Hester Pierce and Mark Udea, yes, I am pronouncing his name right, Udea, um, they both said no, they didn't want to go along with this because they thought that this stretched the boundaries of what Rule 402 or Section 402 of Rule 14A3, uh, yeah, we're in the weeds here, um, you, about what that would allow. Now, I think what jumped out at me was they did say this is a case of first impression, meaning we've never really stopped to think about this before, but they were not comfortable with the idea that if you could mandate this sort of disclosure under Rule 14A3, maybe there would be other sorts of disclosure that the SEC could mandate. And if you want to expand the disclosures, you should have the commissioners propose a rule and then they vote on it. You shouldn't be expanding it through enforcement actions. I see where they're going with that. On the other hand, that part that you cited there, Tom, which was item 402J, that's what the Republicans cited to say that you really are stretching what the rule means. The enforcement division staff cited item 402B of the rule, and that says in part that you are supposed to disclose, quote, specific decisions that were made, or steps that were taken that could affect the fair understanding of the named executive officer's compensation, and that includes factors considered in decisions to increase or decrease compensation materially. Well, like there was a decision made. They could have decreased his, his compensation materially to zero because they could have fired him for cause if they wanted, and they chose not to. So why not? And that gets to the whole point from the enforcement division is that that's what item 402B gets at. You should be explaining to investors why we did or didn't uh, decide to pay this severance package to the, the executive in question. Um, I think that it's, it's an interesting issue because like I said, we're really talking about how boards make judgments and judgments are a reflection of your values and priorities. It looked to me like McDonald said, we could get away with stiffing him because he was a jerk, but that might be a big litigation mess and it could be a big PR nightmare. Let's not do it. And they didn't really flip around. The board didn't until these extra of news items of affairs came out. And now the board looks like they're complete idiots because they got bamboozled by Easterbrook during the investigation. So now, now they decide, no, -uh, we're going to sue you. Maybe they could have treated this differently in the first place. Um, it's entirely possible that Easterbrook would have realized, oh, geez, man, if I litigate this, they'll find out about women B, C, D, and E, and I don't want that, so I'm just going to shut up. Um, you know, we could play these games and parse out these hypotheticals all day long, but I do think that the point here is that investors have a right to know what is the board's perceptions, what is it the board's philosophy or approach in these tough ethical decisions, because the board does represent the shareholders and shareholders do want to make sure that the board aligns with my values before I buy into the company or before I decide to sell the shares or before I decide to have a big messy proxy fight and try and get my board member directors on the board instead. Uh, and that's, that's worth discussing. And that is worth thinking about if you are a corporate securities, corporate governance, corporate ethics enthusiast. Well, let's just keep on going down the weeds further into the rabbit hole by looking at how this might play out with the Department of Justice yes. in two ways. Number one, the De Deputy Attorney General Monaco's thoughts around clawbacks and her thoughts, uh, both as uh, reflected in the Monaco memo, about corporate culture. So this seemed to me to be a pretty good example of clawbacks, at least after the second investigation where they did uh, bring suit and it was resolved. Um, but how does this play out in terms of evaluating a corporate culture? Should the board, uh, you, you said the board could have made a different decision. Uh, 
should they have made a dis- different decision? And how does the decision they make, how could that influence an analysis of overall culture? Well, I do think that this is where it gets interesting and why we should think about this, because, yes, the Republicans were right to say this is a case of first impression. I do not think this is a case of the last. I think, you know, come on, executives get fired for misconduct on a regular basis, and then they get these juicy severance packages and everybody gets upset about it. So this is not a thing that is going to go away. I think instead what the SEC's enforcement division did was turn this messy rock over so we can talk about these issues. Um, But, you know, really, it just comes down to what does the board want to do? It would be interesting if, let's say, the SEC said you must always stiff arm the CEO if you have opportunity to fire them for cause or you have the right to fire them for cause and give them nothing, you should always do that. That's not what the enforcement action said here. It said you didn't disclose that you used discretion thinking about it. Um, If it was the case that the SEC said you always must sack the CEO when they've committed a fireable offense and always take all executive severance with away from them, well, that removes the ability to use discretion. They're simply saying if you're using discretion and making choices, you have to disclose the fact that you are to investors. Um, And I think that this might come up more often. Now, Lisa Monaco has said on numerous occasions, and so have other of her deputies at Justice, that uh, they want to see companies exercise clawback clauses in the event of executive misconduct. So the Justice Department has a clear sense of what your corporate culture should be like and what your priorities should be if you have executive misconduct. And if you're not going to do that, then you should come out and tell investors, we are deciding not to do this. We are going against what the Justice Department would like to see. I think that would be a controversial decision. I also think the Justice Department knows this and they are very subtly trying to apply pressure so that future boards will not actually go down McDonald's path and say, yeah, we could just give him nothing because he really was a jerk, but we're just going to wash this out the door, let him take a severance and be done with it. I don't think the Justice Department likes to see that. I I do think it's a reflection of the board's priorities, which is less litigation, less publicity risk, more shareholder money going to a CEO who got fired for doing something wrong. Uh, That doesn't sound like a very good culture to me. So I'm not quite sure what analysis there is here. And to a certain extent, there's some black and white and common sense issues that most investors, most people out in the street would say, if you have done something pretty skeezy and Easterbrook did, then you shouldn't get a lucrative reward for it. And that's that. Well, I have to say I disagree with that because uh, you've listed several factors uh, which make it not just that, that there's, uh, the litigation costs, embarrassment, the time and money and effort, uh, and other fat, and you can always lose in litigation. Um, so it seems to me that there are factors to consider uh, simply because someone violates a code of conduct and that's a termination defense. I don't think that automatically rises to a level of a clawback um, yet, but perhaps that's where we're all headed. You know, that might be a valid argument, Tom, but as you said, there are factors to consider. And the SEC in this enforcement action saying, yes, exactly. So tell investors that you look, we had to think this through. There are a lot of factors we had to consider. So we decided the juice is not worth the squeeze. Let this executive take the severance and get him out the door. Um, Not just the rather vague boilerplate of we have reached a separation agreement and, you know, he's out and that's it. They want a more fulsome disclosure to investors about how you reach these decisions and what sort of considerations you make. Um, I don't know. Opinions can differ on this. And you're right that maybe litigation risks in some occasions would be quite high. And maybe if you stuck to your guns, it would be even more expensive for shareholders. And that's a valid argument to take and a line of inquiry to explore. The SEC's enforcement action here is all about the idea that you have to disclose that you're using that discretion. And given that CEO dismissals happen on a regular basis for uh, misconduct of some kind or for cause, I don't think that this is going to be the last time we see something like this. And the SEC has now said, 
you should be more forthcoming about your decisions and your considerations when you do decide to let the CEO take the severance and leave. Uh, so, Matt, this is uh, really great that we could take uh, a well-worn sexual imbroglio leading us to uh, perhaps new interpretation of some SEC rules and even implications for FCP FCPA uh, cases, both in terms of clawbacks and uh, the DOJ's analysis of a corporate culture. So uh, pretty interesting. It is indeed, Tom. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you've ever thought about starting your own podcast, I hope you will consider joining the Compliance Podcast Network. If you like information on how to start a podcast or about joining the CPN, please give me a shout. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. The award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.